What's going on, guys? Chris, the Bonafide Hustler, coming to you live from the inside of my office. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. I definitely have to do a sound check, so if you can hear me, let me know in the YouTube feed. If you're watching this show right now and it has a small little live button on there, it means it's live. It means there's also a comment feed on the right-hand side where you can interact with uh, you know, the content that's going on. So anyway, um, I, I'm the Bonafide Hustler. I reside in Austin, Texas. I flip stuff I find from garage sales state sales, yard sales, flea markets, pawn shops, swap meets, and I put it on eBay, Amazon, uh, antique booth, Craigslist, and a consignment store in town. I am one of the admins of the greenroomuniversity.com. Definitely go check that out. And today we're going to be looking at uh, flips that I've done. See, this is the thing. I have a 32 gig card that spans tail end of 2015 all the way up to... Uh, I want to say December of 2016. And I really want to get through that content and teach you guys from a lot of the pictures that of things that I have flipped. You know, I want to teach you guys basically, you know, my thought process and why these things sold for really good money. And today we're going to be talking about seven of them. So yes, we're going to the Bonafide Archives today. And it's a lot of fun. I really want to get through this card. Now, these aren't, you know, if you notice, like some of the numbers on the card won't be consecutive. That's because there are certain things that I didn't want to talk about. I wanted to pull some pretty good ones out and talk to you guys about that. Maybe I'll go back into the uh, picture file and pull out some of the other ones. But, uh, you know, it's just some of those things that I want to make sure that I got seven random items that, you know, hopefully you guys can learn something from. So anyway, and some of these things you might have heard from my other videos, but, uh, you know, Hey, bread and butter items are really, really important to flip. While I have you guys here, check out 100 Amazing Items to Resell. It's the first link down below. You can get it, and it's free on your phone. But today, let's talk about seven items that resold for really good money. I want to shout out some people that are in the feed live right now. Today, we have Garage Flips. We have Jamie, or maybe Jaime, never know, uh, Alice, 14 Emelina, Michelle. We have Clearing Clutter for Clarity and Mike Raleigh in the house. Mike Raleigh is already saying go green room. So there you go. Green room is a good place to be. You can check it out also down below. I think it's the second link if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so we got 34 viewers in the house. I'm going to do a screen share type show and we're going to go into the first item right now. So let me get this to the feed here. Present to everyone. And I believe I might have shown this before on a Facebook post or something like that. So just kind of bear with me because it's really important to learn what these items are, uh, what I got them for. And if I take a second of micro hesitation, it's also because I do have my sales sheet to my right. If I swipe right, I have this incredibly large sales sheet of things that I have sold and um, it's all cataloged. So if I have to type in this one just to remember what I sold it for, but I'm pretty sure I remember, I remember right now. Um, I might have to do that because we are talking about seven items that have seven different buy and seven seven different sold prices. So I'm um, trying to you know get the best uh, how do I say it um, information to you guys, but I like to be super accurate too if I can. Okay, so the very first one uh, that we want to talk about today are lithium ion chargers. All right, and a lot of times these go to uh, you. You got to be thinking when you see these things; these are going to household or lawn type appliances, but it can go into something as simple as like a dust buster. Um, and I'm not saying the dust buster is, it's a, it's a dust buster type device that can use something like this. Also leaf blowers. Um, there are a lot of the times they're very interchangeable and a lot of them will go into tools, you know, like uh, sawzalls. They'll be also in uh, impact drivers, um, drills, things like that, maybe even a circular saw. So a lot of these, uh, whether it's Black & Decker or it's this brand works, or you get Makita, Milwaukee, um, any of those other brands that you might see at Home Depot. What's important to note is that, uh, you know, the tool is worth some money for sure, but the dock and the battery is also worth a whole lot of money because a lot of times, you know, a battery doesn't last an entire job. So people have to have multiple batteries to do, you know, jobs with these devices that are lithium, you know, they run off lithium power. So let's take a look at this one real quick. This one's from Works. This was a $10 find from a garage sale that sold for 90 bucks, right? And it's not terribly large or anything. It's a slightly heavy kind of thing, but definitely no, not over really like three pounds or anything. Um, but yeah, so what do you do when you find something like this? Let's say maybe at a Goodwill, or maybe you'll find it at a garage sale. So it's very important because I've flipped these battery things about three or four times over, different brands, of course. And um, some I found at church garage sales, some I find at garage sales, and I think some I've even found at um, their stores, right? So we can take a look at this. And uh, of course, you definitely 
If you can locate the battery, that's great, but a lot of times you really can't test much unless you have the charger. Because with the charger and the battery you get, with lithium type devices, you get the ability to, yes, charge the battery, but you also get to see if it retains the charge and if the little light meter on the side actually reflects that it's charged. So it'll look something like this, right? There's a little thing that you press this button and basically tells you how much battery life is left on the battery. But if you're finding it out there in the wild and you press the button, likely there's gonna be nothing that comes up because it might not have any charge to it. So that's why you gotta put it on the charger. Now this is not how you put it on the charger. I mean, you put it on different ways, different, different brands are gonna have different ways. Some are slide in, some are top down uh, popping in. But either way, you have to get them into the charging dock, right? And then after that, you know, charge for about, you know, one to four hours, whatever. And um, you press a little button and now it shows a full charge. So, you know, this one's probably good for market. Um, now, these can be all the way, you know, 48 volts. They can have different type voltage. But really what you're looking for is the keyword to be lithium. You definitely don't want to be messing with NICAD or nickel metal hydride. NIMH, any of those kind of things. You really want to be looking for this keyword lithium, okay? So it might be in very small letters and in some, you know, things like uh, Makita or I want to say Ryobi, it's pretty large, right? And a lot of these tools are going to have crazy colors to their thing, like a Milwaukee might be completely red and it looks all badass, whereas a Ryobi is like neon green and it looks really cool. And then, uh, you know, some of these other brands are just, they make some really cool colored kind of things. It's usually two-toned type batteries they look really neat so you definitely want to look for lithium that's the key word if it doesn't say lithium i would not mess with it it's just not worth it but lithium definitely has a you know arguably somewhere between i don't know really maybe 1500 to 3000 charges you know it, it's the same kind of battery that's in your cell phone so think about that it's the uh battery that can be plugged on and on and on and on and recharged and you know it can it basically is a very smart battery if you can look at it that way. So they have different types of cells in there, but 48 volts is pretty high. Um, and a lot of them are going to have this uh, protective kind of casing because it's pretty industrial and it usually has to like pop in or slide into whatever unit it's going into, whether it be a trimmer, a leaf blower, um, an edger. It could be as simple as a dust buster, like I said, um, but that's what these batteries kind of slip into for the most part. Now, Works is not even the best brand, right? This is just a normal brand. But like I said, 10 bucks turned into 90. I thought it was a great flip. And uh, it was one of those things. You take the $10 risk, bring it home, charge it. Four hours later, has all those little markings on there like that. And that's what I'm looking for. So um, let me make sure that everything sounds good here. Uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me. I'm hoping. So yeah, let me make sure. <laughs> Let me make sure, oh gosh, Terry Berry says, Bonafide, he's the reseller with hella good hair. Man, I'm trying to grow my hair out and it's just in that really, really bad stage right now where it's like, oh gosh. So um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those. But uh, I have a hat on today just because it feels like having a hat on today. Um, okay, so hopefully, let me go through the feed here and just make 100% sure we're good here. If anything is all off in the feed or anything good, thank you, Clear and Clutter, for clarity. Someone's helping me with the sound here. If something's odd in the feed or there's someone that needs to be like taken out, just let me know. But for the most part, let's just keep going. All right. So thanks, guys, by the way. So we got 66 viewers in the house. Uh, definitely one of the perks of being on a live show is that you uh, are more likely to be seen because the channel has grown so much to where I can't even get to normal comments anymore. So let's go to the next item. And, um, Okay, so here we have a Royal typewriter, pretty cool. Um, this one made it to my booth, right? Now there are two different ways you, you can kind of like go after these kind of things. I'm gonna show you many ways to hustle this thing. Okay, so one is it mess with it intact just like this. But then you gotta understand that this thing is really, really heavy. So if you don't have a thing like an antique booth to move it, then you, not, you need to start thinking Craigslist or offer up or something local because this is a heavy, it what feels like cast iron or some sort of, you know, it's definitely not aluminum or anything like that. This is metal. It's a heavy unit. Okay. So, I mean, you could even crossfit with this and do kettlebell swings if you want. Um, but it is not light. It, uh, you know, with a bit of typewriter knowledge, like for some reason, I still have some of it from back my uh, word processor days or whatever, you know, and I hate to say that word because it kind of dates everything and dates myself. But, you know, in the word processor days, things kind of, 
operate the same way with these old typewriters. And so with the old typewriters, you don't get any kind of ink or anything like you get ribbon, right? Ribbon with these little keys that go up to the ribbon and hits the ribbon and it imprints the what seems to be like almost like ink dust onto a piece of paper. And then the little thing retracts back. And I know you probably guys know what I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, the, the cover flips up right here. OK, very important. And trust me, you'll end up finding this in the wild. It's it's just a no-brainer. So that's one of the ways that you can flip it is flip it locally, flip it in an antique booth. It's heavy. And one of the other ways you can kind of flip these is you can just flip the ribbon that's inside. The ribbon's worth money, right? And so maybe I have a picture of it open with the ribbon. So uh, this one I actually did, did take the ribbon out and I flipped it. So the ribbon is gone on this one, right? So it goes right here in the spools. And then you, you lace the ribbon right behind this thing, which... I don't know what we'll call that, but we'll call it uh, something. We'll call it the uh, the cheddar spreader, right? Um, so yeah, you flip it right through this cheddar spreader, and then it goes to the other spool right here. And then these are the keys that go up, and they hit it, and then the paper is behind in the little roller feed feature thing, which is this. It's complex, but honestly, you know, pre cell phones and pre word processors and pre MacBook Pros. I mean, this is kind of like what people had. So. The third way that you can actually flip these things kind of is just to flip the keys and the keys you can put straight to eBay, right? You can lay them all out make them look all good, but you can flip just the top parts, just the keys on eBay for, you know, somewhere between 30 and 60 bucks. Um, so that's pretty interesting as well. And you know how light that's going to be, right? This is pretty light stuff. This doesn't, this is not heavy. The body of this is what's heavy. So this is a Royal typewriter. Um, you know, it's nothing super special. But it probably came out of the 30s or 40s, maybe something like that. And um, something I found in the garage sale for, I believe, 10 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's 10 bucks. And this one actually sold in my booth for 110. So that is a pretty good little score right there. So, you know, I did some high quality pictures because I thought this was going to go on eBay. But then after further kind of determining, like, okay, this is like really heavy, like, I don't think I really want to put this to eBay. This one ended up going to my booth instead. And it actually stayed in my booth for like four months. So it took a little bit of time to sell, but that's just uh, the avenue I wanted to move it. And I really wanted some cool old stuff in my booth for really low money. And so a $10 play that, you know, materializes into 110. That's a pretty good item to have in a booth. It makes it look, it's a very inviting kind of thing. Now, another thing, if you have a booth and you have a typewriter in your booth, definitely place them high because kids will definitely want to F with it. the whole thing, man. I can't tell you, even when placing it high and I come revisit my booth, like how many times the keys were like completely stuck together and someone had just jacked with the whole thing. So I can't imagine what it would be like if I had put it down at like kid level. So that's just kind of like a heads up. Um, you know, definitely put this thing up a little higher, like shoulder level at least, at minimum, adult shoulder level if you have a booth. Okay. Um... So yeah, we got a lot of people in the feed, <laughs> got a lot of people in the feed here talking about this. But anyway, you're definitely guaranteed to come across this kind of stuff at garage sales. And the funny thing is, a lot of times the garage sales, they're gonna want like fifty or they're gonna want sixty, sometimes a hundred bucks for these things, and I just pass because I don't want to mess with that. But when it was ten bucks, I mean, it was a no-brainer, you know. So I found this one. I found a couple. I've even found a broken one, but still sold for okay money. And then sometimes you'll find different colored ones, um, like a light blue or a light gray one. Um, and as they got a little bit more advanced, they start getting a lot more, how do I say it? It's like sleek looking almost like the future, like Jetson style, you know? So this is very old. We know this is probably like, I don't know. This is between, it's probably 30s or 40s in my guess. But if someone is out there in the feed that can correct me, that's great. Let me know. Um, this is a Royal typewriter. And the model is usually going to be on the back. Let me show you the model. That was just a question that came from uh, Joseph Park. And the model is usually right back here or it's underneath, but it's around one of these two places. I remember finding it, but it was not exactly super easy. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So Don Brown's saying, where's the link to the new Bonafide Hustler shirts? Yeah. If you go to Amazon and you type in uh, official Bonafide Hustler merchandise, and there's also a link down below in the feed right now, um, like in the actual description of this video, there is a link to the new shirts. But if you go into Amazon and put it, official Bonafide Hustler merchandise, you will find the new edition two line of, actually it's edition one of Bonafide Hustler shirts that are 80s inspired. Really cool. I love them. So go check it out. Definitely supports the channel and everything. Okay. So let's move over to the uh, next kind of, and I, I wish I could tell you like 
how to operate this thing, but you can kind of figure it out through trial and error. It's it's it's, it's hella crazy, but uh, just remember, like, if you absolutely are like, okay, I don't want to move that. No one's picking up on offer up. No one's picking up on Craigslist. Like, just take these keys off. Figure out the way to take the keys off and pop them off, and then throw them into a bag and put them on. Uh, Throw them, on, I mean, throw them onto eBay. Now, here's the key word you have to use if you're going to put the keys on uh, eBay, just the keys. You're going to have to use the word steampunk because that is important. Okay, so let's go to the next item. This is a banger of a freaking hustle right here. So who here has hustled these types of items? Like this is a DeLonghi Magnifica espresso all-in-one kind of maker. Who here has flipped stuff like this you're gonna be like holy crap so i'm gonna tell you something about this one this one was broken okay this was a broken unit so let me go into you guys i want to go into the feed and reach out to whoever is going to answer that question um let me get some remarks also which is uh john Gomez or Gomes says those keys would be an item to definitely steampunk with people. Yeah. So what steampunk is, is basically it's, uh, how do I really say it? It's like a marriage, not like a true marriage, but it's a marriage between technology that didn't exist back in the day and you insert it in time where it really doesn't belong. So like people that buy those old computer keys or those old typewriter keys would affix them to new like macbook keyboards or new macbook pro or something like that to where it's like what the hell this is a current macbook with these old typewriter keys so it's like you know marrying two things that really don't belong together and that's what steampunk kind of is it's uh it's putting technology into parts of time where it doesn't belong and creating these artificial type of items that didn't really even exist but it's just the art of creating those things so that's the best way i can kind of explain it to you guys um Thrift, thrift shop hustler in the feed saying thanks bonafide hustler for all you do one of the first youtubers i watched uh, a year ago and it really inspired me so thank yeah you're welcome you're definitely welcome uh garage flips is uh basically saying it's like post-apocalyptic um stuff when you deal with steampunk yeah it's kind of like post-apocalyptic it's like making do with what you still have left after all the craziness happens right um and people are referring to mad max it's like an alternate future yeah so you kind of get what I'm talking about, but here's one of those things. It's kind of like homework for you guys, but definitely go into eBay and type in the word steampunk and you can put in steampunk laptop, steampunk keyboard, steampunk Nerf gun, steampunk jacket, right? And just see what comes up and you're going to be like completely astonished. And it's just a really interesting thing to look at. Now, if you don't want to go through eBay auctions, you just want to go through Google images and check out, you know, steampunk cosplay, for example, and go into Google with that and steampunk plus C O S P L A Y. And you'll start to see all the different things that some people definitely look for. And you might find that, hey, you know, certain types of aviation goggles, for example, like World War II style or World War I style, the ones that the people use for like the biplanes and stuff, you know, like the Red Baron, those things you can just throw on eBay, call them World War II goggles and put in the word steampunk. And you'd be surprised like the market just grows just because you put that word steampunk in there because people are looking for those kind of things to alter them or just to wear them, you know, as part of their cosplay costume. It's kind of weird, right? It's almost as weird as LARPing. I don't even know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but LARPing is like crazy weird. Um, and there's definitely a weird, weird like market for that, at least in here in Austin. So when I go mountain biking in the trails, um, when I'm rigging my mountain bike on Saturday morning, you know, Sunday morning, not Saturday mornings, but Sunday mornings, and the LARPers are all out there. Sometimes there's like a group of like 40 LARPers going at each other with like these wooden swords and shields, like about to kick the crap out of each other. And it is nuts. Like I've seen them like form two walls or two like sides, like Braveheart style. And man, it's like kind of crazy. And it's like, you definitely, like, you can see all the mountain bikers that are just like kind of chilled out and they're just like waiting for like these two sides to like clash with each other. And when it clash, when they clash with each other, it's kind of scary because they're coming at each other with like wooden swords and wooden shields and all this crazy stuff um, to where you're like, I know this is like kind of fake, but like this looks crazy. So anyway, <laughs> live action role play is what it stands for, LARPing. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> so people know what I guess what, what I'm talking about. But when you see it in real life, it's just totally different. It's almost like watching a gigantic train wreck about to happen. So you know you can't look away from that, right? Okay. So let's go into this uh, espresso machine. Enough of uh, my little bona fide rants here. 
Uh, let me get this screen share going into here. Okay. So this was a machine I found at a, at a Goodwill. And this machine was looking really, really good. Okay. And I'm pretty sure it's this not even complete because, um, you know, there's certain things that come with like shot glasses and stuff, but some of the most important things were there. Now, it is made by a decent brand, DeLonghi, right? Um, uh, Gagia would be a really good one as well. G-A-G-G-I-A. -G -G even the Starbucks barista machine would be good. Um, so this machine, believe it or not, um, variants of this machine start somewhere between 600 bucks and go all the way up to $1,000, okay? Now you're thinking like, why the hell? Well, it's because these things also do, um, you know, espresso on demand, macchiatos on demand, cappuccinos on, the, on demand different size cups, as you can see the little buttons right here. And uh, it's got a little separate like milk uh, thing to where you can like put the milk somewhere else It heats it up and then it brings it through the machine and then it, uh, you know, makes the lattes or whatever that needs milk. So it's a hella crazy, you know, how do I say it? It's a pretty advanced machine. Well, it better be really advanced for 600 to a thousand dollars. Like it better be a little bit more advanced than that typical machine that you see in a hotel room, right? So this is a machine that, and this is one of those things, like when you're going to think about popping on one of these from a Goodwill, and uh, this wasn't my first one I've ever popped on. Like I popped on many of those Starbucks barista ones, some croups, um, just some other random ones, and some from garage sales as well. I've sold broken ones from garage sales for great money, and this one turned out to be broken. But for what I was kind of seeing on the uh, tail end with the brief research I did inside the actual Goodwill on that day, I realized it's worth the $32.46 that I spent on it, right? I'm like, I'm going to take the risk. And plus, that Goodwill, you could return something in seven days if, if, you know, and I think all Goodwills have this return policy where if it doesn't work in seven days, you at least get store credit, which is great because we're thrifters and we go to Goodwills all the time anyway. So let's look a little bit closer into this machine. Single touch cappuccino latte, blah, blah, blah. Single touch, right? Talk about some lazy people. Um, but quite honestly, let, let, you know, not poking fun, but like, I don't want to make any of that stuff either. So if I could have a single touch machine, I think it'd be great. Uh, I just don't want to clean anything. I'm a guy. I don't like cleaning anything. So, um, so here we have drip tray. So it's kind of some, some of the important things that you kind of need to know about these machines is that you're all, you're always going to try to want to find when you're dealing with these big ones, you're going to definitely try to find the water, uh, the water tank, which is typically back here somewhere. It's integrated in the machine. And then you have usually what's called like the milk frothing kind of thing device, which is this right here. And it has a little tube going in there and it frosts the milk and it brings it through the machine and then it pours the latte. Um, you're going to want to definitely find, you know, if it definitely does lattes or anything dealing with milk, there's probably going to be an ancillary or integrated um, latte, uh, milk frothing type steamer thing. And that's what this is. Then some of the uh, <laughs> dogs are going crazy outside. Um, and then one of the other things that you want to look for is the drip tray. Make sure it has the drip tray. And the drip tray is usually two, anywhere between two and four pieces. So here we have a drip tray. Oh, my dogs. There must be someone at the door. Anyway, so the drip tray. Um, actually, hold on one sec. I just realized something. I have a Craigslist flip to bring to the door. Oh, man. One, one second. All right. Give me one second, guys. Holy crap, that was super funny. All right, hold on. 
yeah now now who's a real hustler in the house right um now i gotta <laughs> i gotta see the uh comments i totally forgot and you know you know what before i decided to do the show i was like there's something i'm missing i don't know what it is oh this is what it was so anyway <laughs> yeah oh jillian i know everyone's kind of like laughing they're seeing the dogs um was that a gunshot no 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 i actually sold something that was workout related so all right business first that's right all right thanks guys that i i was not planning for that at all i knew there was something i was missing i knew it and that was it okay so let's go into the uh screen share man that is funny I, i'm not gonna I'm, i know the admins in the green room are gonna figure it out and they're gonna kind of come at me but anyway um okay so let's talk about this machine so yeah when you're dealing with these machines all right, you know, don't be scared. First of all, one of the best things you can do is figure out if there's any way you can buy it down. Coupon, um, is there a certain color code kind of thing? All that you got to be thinking about because some of these things will get kind of pricey, right? I mean, even if this thing was 50 bucks, I'm gonna tell you right now, like you should still pop on it, but you, you got to maximize your discounts as much as possible. Second of all, you got to figure out if there's some sort of return policy because that's another just line of insurance that you can resort to should you figure out that maybe you know this piece right here doesn't isn't worth what you thought it was or whatever the whole entire machine's not working so i go home i plug it in machine's not working right but it has a lot of these other parts that are still worth good money like for example this milk frothing cup kind of thing still for about 50 bucks it's on its own right well you got to think the machine is like a 600 to a thousand dollar machine right there's two variants of this machine so uh, this is the lower of the two variants right um and you know just the if a machine's like 60 i mean sorry 600 bucks the heating element's going to be a solid probably 200 the drip tray is going to be a solid probably you know 35 or so the milk frothing cup yes the milk frothing cup's probably going to be worth a pretty decent amount because you can't substitute anything for this. Like you just, you have to have this part or your thing doesn't work. So some people might've broken theirs. It might've fallen on the ground. And these are the kind of things that are going on in my head when I purchase this type of item, okay? So here is froth milk cha cappuccino, as you can see. It's crazy advanced. Like you could not just slide in a cup or whatever you want of your thing. And some of the other devices like out there that are even really high-end devices have a almost like a cup on the side. It's really weird. This one had it integrated, so it was really smooth looking, um, you know, but still you'd be surprised. Some of these like 2000 and 3000 dollar machines have like on the side type of like milk chillers slash uh, weird things that are just like outside of the device completely just have a hose that goes right to it. So it's kind of interesting um, how this one was integrated and was less. Um, now when you pop up with the machine, this is where it gets really complicated. You probably don't know anything that you're seeing right here but it's got all kinds of weird things. And uh, the heating element did not work on this machine. Both doors open up on each side. Um, the water tank is behind one of these doors. The other one is to catch like uh, coffee grounds that it's like disposing of. And so I think that's what this thing was. I mean, it's got all kinds of crazy things that are happening when you press a button. It's like these little elevators start moving up and down. And it is, I, you know, to me, I'm like, I don't understand how these things don't break more often, but uh, the heating element didn't work on this one. Right. But for instance, this guy right here, which I think might have even been the heating element. I'm not 100 percent sure, but this was something I know that this piece alone was like probably 70 bucks on the machine. Right. So in that machine with the two tabs, you could pull out and sell it on its own. So a lot of things are running through my head when I buy this thing for thirty dollars, thirty two dollars and forty six cents. OK, there's the water tank on the side. As you can see, it's got a top uh, fill kind of thing. Actually, no, this one just pulls right out. So this you pull it and the tank just slides right out and you fill it up with water um this one also had a burr grinder kind of thing or i guess that's what they call them it's where you put the beans in here um and it grinds it to you know really really fine to whatever you want you know so um yeah you have to shovel the beans in there for whatever you know whatever drinks you want um so yeah that's something that's interesting about this machine too okay so this machine ended up selling for $226 or $229.99 in broken condition. Pretty cool, right? Um, all intact like this was a complete bitch to like pack up. But, you know, it wasn't terribly heavy. In fact, when it comes down to like actual size, it's bigger than this typewriter. But it wasn't heavier than the typewriter, right? And it has a little bit more um, like a nice upright, like could fit in theoretically maybe a 14 by 14 by 18 box or something like that so you know 
think about that when you're coming across these in the wild. Try to stay away from really dumb brands like Cuisinart and um, like Croups, like a lot of those like really, I don't know, they're not, just not that good. Like start looking for more premium brands like Seiko, S-A-E-C-O, uh, DeLonghi, um, you have other ones. And I say premium, but this is like home-based premium. Of course, this isn't like restaurant quality premium. Of course, you can get home slash restaurant quality premium things. And you'll find those at like upper end kind of stores like Sur La Table or Le Creuset or things like that. So this is probably upper consumer end type devices. Um, yeah. So it's crazy. So yeah, I mean, definitely look into that. The, the, even the Starbucks barista machine, definitely that's your eBay homework of the day. Look into that, understand that one, because you'll find that one more than any of these that I'm showing you right now. You'll find the Starbucks barista espresso machine. And just remember what I tell you, like the things that should be going on your head, first of all, is there a coupon in this store? Can I use a coupon? You know, can I buy it down any way possible? Second thing you should think is like, how many other things are there that I can sell? Like the drip tray on the Starbucks barista machine is I think a three piece unit. And the last one I sold was like $22.99. The uh, percolator, which can be removed very easily. It's a, uh, that was 39. I've never sold one less than $39.99. Um, the Starbucks temperature that's included with the milk frothing cup uh, sold that for 20 bucks and, um, the two shot glasses that come with it, I've sold those for 12 99. So, you know, if you find the Starbucks one, that's the one you should definitely study. I guarantee you, if you look at that one tonight, you'll make money from this video for sure. Down the load, down the, down the line for sure. hundred percent. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can, so, so rags 1602, you so could get your money out of piecing it out as well. Yeah. So, you know, I like to just, you know, if it's relatively complete and it's something big like this, I wanted to get, because I know that like without the milk frothing cup and without pretty much anything inside, like the DeLonghi Magnifica shell and maybe the drip tray was there, it was like 137. But the fact that the frothing cup was in there, the heating element that was broken, maybe it could be redone. The water tank was in there, all this stuff. And it turned on like, that's really what I think got me to 226 or 229, whatever it sold for. So interesting, right? Yeah. And there's definitely something that's missing here. Like here's a place to put like some other coffee grounds or maybe beans. And here's a scoop that didn't come with it. But you know, you can kind of see that these things are probably worth 600 to a thousand bucks, honestly, like in the end, they probably are, but just expect that they probably won't last very long. Okay. So let's go into the next item. This was a uh, interesting find. This was a garage sale find. So I'm going to go into my Google sheet here. You can't see that part, but let me type it in my garage sale section and I want to put in the Radio Shack. I think this is called it Enforcer. All right. This was a $7.50 RC truck and it sold for 90 bucks. Okay. Now I think what was key in this one is that anytime that you deal with old Radio Shack, old Radio Shack consumer radio controlled vehicles, especially vehicles that are like jacked up trucks that look like Toyota trucks or Ford trucks, they're going to be really ornate. They're going to be really kind of over the top and they're going to have really, they're going to have a lot of chrome pieces and some might even have little smokestack exhaust things that comes to the side, pretty big bumpers. So that's definitely one of the things that you want to start looking for when you find one and you're going to start turning it over and right to the left underneath and make sure nothing's really missing or broken. Even though in broken condition, you probably could have got like 50 bucks, 60 bucks. But the fact that this one had the box was our big piece of the puzzle. And it was in really good condition. So this is probably a late 90s um, RC. Um, you know, the, the tires didn't have what's called flat spots, which means if it was stored improperly, the rubber, uh, you know, just because of the gravity of the car or the truck, ends up giving it like almost like a dimple, right? And so there's no flat spots on this truck, which was really good. It means it was stored correctly. The bumper wasn't cracked or anything, which means probably kids didn't play that with this one too much. This was probably adult owned. Um, not too much, uh, you know, scuffs on the, <coughs> on the stickers. Ah, probably more Craigslist stuff. Um, so we also have on the other side, a very universal type look, like I'm looking for this, which is the fuel tank, the step I'm looking for the, um, roll bar and the lights, right? So when we go to the left side, 
you know, we should see the same thing. And so that's kind of the check I'm looking for. That one, that one, that one. And the lights looks good. And same side on the other one looks good. And then that's how you kind of go around it and you assess. And a lot of these consumer grade radio control cars will have a high and low switch on the back. If you're dealing with a good one, it'll usually have a high and low switch. Um, and some of them even have a turbo and non-turbo switch on the controller, which I'm not sure if this one does, but we can take a look here in a second. Probably does not, but it might. So this one just has a normal go forward. Some have like a forward plus an extra like turbo key, right? Um, and then this is the right and left. This is the throttle or reverse. And pretty basic radio control vehicle with proportional steering, like nothing exciting, honestly. Um, it's classified as four wheel drive. But what that means is it has <laughs> motors in, actually, no, this one's actually really cool. And I'll show you why, because this one's four wheel drive, but done the right way. Okay. It has a really big motor back here with a rod, right? From a differential that's throwing the power to the front axle. This is kind of technical, like, well, not really technical. Hopefully you guys can understand it, but that's the real way to do four wheel drive. Like back in the day, that was good. Like the way that current day radio control cars try to do four wheel drive is they put a motor up front and they put a motor in the back, right? They put a motor here, they put a motor there, and then it's all you know, done with an ESC or electronic speed control unit. And it's almost ghetto. Like it's just not right. So like the real way to do four wheel drive is to do um, basically what normal cars do. Like you have the engine in the front then you have a differential um, and then you throw the power to the rear where there's an axle and converts the power into the rear wheels. And this one has the motor in the back converting the power to the front. So it's really neat. Now, if you flip the car over or the truck over, um, they'll have a battery compartment usually for a six cell battery. That's typically nickel metal hydride or um, NICAD. Okay. So that's where you stick the battery. And then also this one had it to, to actually, how do I say it? To bring power to the receiver um, or the servo and the receiver. And this one even needed a nine volt battery, which had slight corrosion inside the terminal. Uh, it needed a nine volt battery on top of that other six cell battery. So it was kind of weird. Like I've never seen that kind of thing before, but so here it is radio control, you know, radio controlled four wheel drive, four wheel suspension, seven functions, turbo power, excellent performance. I guess it did have turbo. Let's go back to that. Um, yeah, I guess maybe this is like a micro turbo. See how it has whatever. It's really not turbo, but maybe it is. <laughs> it's really not turbo. Trust me. But anyway, so, um, yeah. And so John Gomes is saying, I'm an RC guy and there's definitely a difference between toy and hobby grade. Yeah. So this is definitely toy grade. This is not hobby grade at all. This is consumer. Like you walk into a, a radio shack and this is what you would find on the shelves. Um, Don Brown has a great question. Uh, could you do a crawler body and sell the controller as a replacement or a whole thing? I have to do the box. So you could, you know, you might be able to crawler body this one, but it's just not that big. Like it's not that big of a truck compared to like normal kind of, trucks these days so the crawler body on this one's probably 18 inches long 17 inches long you could try i just don't think it would have as good a potential as a, a current day new bright crawler body or a nico crawler body that you could sell on uh, ebay so um yes and john gomes says you know one of the big differences between uh toy grade and hobby grade is that hobby grade uses a lot of times now like lithium batteries and uh the ones that go up to 20 miles an hour, maybe 25, 30, you will use nickel metal hydride or uh, NICAD nickel cadmium batteries. But all the toy grade ones, almost all the toy grade ones are going to be using um, NIMH, nickel metal hydride or uh, nickel cadmium, or they're going to be using actual batteries like AA, AAA, D batteries, whatever, things like that. So anyway, yeah, I'm kind of an RC nut too, but almost like a closet you know, RC nut. I used, I had my days back in the day. So, um, that's that pretty nice little fine 750 turning it to 90 bucks. That was pretty good. And there it is back in the box and it's off to go. All right. So here's a really good find. Um, let me make sure I get you the right information on this. Let me go into my goodwill spreadsheet here and find this one. All right. So this one was a $5 and 83 cent find at a goodwill. So I'll tell you exactly what's going on there through my head here. This one sold for 90 bucks. Okay. 90 bucks. So these are Alpine stars, uh, tech three. Now I'm not hundred percent sure if these were 
dirt bike or if these are sport bike type boots. Um, I believe sport bike, but I'm not 100, 100, 100, 100 sure. But anyway, uh, Alpine Stars, um, more than likely sport bike, but Alpine Stars is a great, you know, motorcycle enthusiast type apparel brand that builds um, gloves, jackets, pants, um, and shirts and boots. So um, think of it as a really protection type brand. So they're, they're really protecting you if you fly off the bike and you hit the pavement or whatever. Um, that's going to be definitely an Alpine Stars type of item that you might be uh, scuffing up. So they don't, I don't, not 100% sure that they build helmets. I don't think they do. But anyway, so here's are some Tech 3 boots. They're in great condition. Now, one of the things before I popped on this and decided to sell them is a lot of times when boots go wrong, they're going to go wrong with delamination right around here. And they're going to, um, you know, go wrong with these kind of like clips, okay? The clips that, you know, make it a nice snug fit when you clip them all. So um, much like a snowboard, uh, not like a snowboard, but uh, like a ski boot, right? Um, that's kind of like the way it, it ratchets a little bit and then it finally has a final closure strap and then you're all tucked in ready to ride. So you want to look for that. You also want to look for smashed plastic, like, you know, maybe from impact, like some of this other plastic that makes, makes it look all futuristic and almost like judge dreadish, you know, but you want to make sure that that's not cracked it either. So follow your stitch lines, follow your, your plastic lines and make sure nothing's cracked and definitely test these clasps. Okay. And then the last thing you want to do is definitely look for delamination, which is separation from the sole from the main body of the shoe. Very common, especially with older type boots. So yeah, five bucks buy all day is what 14 and Molina says. Um, yeah, this it's, it's amazing. So blue gorilla flippers saying that's a real score on the boots. Those things cost crazy money new. Um, see our prophecies. These are dirt. Um, like I said, I can't remember. Um, so yeah, they're very neat looking, right? And uh, here's a size seven, which is probably a little, you know, kid or teenager or something like that. Maybe even women's. Uh, it says U EUR 40.5. So probably women's actually. And, um, you know, they have a little suede side to them. And a lot of times with impact, the only real like super wear that this thing has were these tiny scuffs that you see right here. So that is probably just from rubbing up against the plastics of the bike or something like that. But, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see wear and tear from pedal, uh, <clears throat> the shifter on one of the sides. Um, and, you know, it, there's just a plethora of things, especially if they're dirt bike, true dirt bike boots. There's a plethora of things to check over. But a lot of them will come down to actually uh, checking the clasp. That's the main one you want to check for. Okay, so uh, next item right here. This is a really good find from the same Goodwill. And hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying some stuff on this show. Like I said, while I have you guys here, if you want more good things, bread and butter type of clips to uh, you know look at in your spare time, check this out. It's the very first link in the description below. It's a Green Room Guide, 100 Amazing Items to Resell. It's the first link down below. Go get it for free. Put you on our amazing email list, which you can get some good Green Room University discounts through there as well. If you're thinking about joining the university, good place to be. And our event is right around the corner in July. So we're definitely working hard to uh, get that done and uh, all the plans through. But it's it's hard to do. I'll tell you, it's not easy. So um, you guys having fun on the show? Want to make sure we got 70, 78 viewers in the house. Uh, we got 21 upvotes. Oh, yeah. I never asked you guys. Like I hardly ever... I really don't remember to ask this. So if you could like the video, please go ahead and like the video. Um, we got 21 upvotes, three downvotes, three people don't like the information. And that is fine. But just trust me, like I really aim like not to just sit there and brag about some of this stuff that I have sold in the past, but like to really teach you guys through it. I think it's really important because, you know, if I didn't say anything, but just like, hey, look, I found an espresso machine for 30 bucks and then I sold it for two something. And then you sit there and go, oh, cool. And then you come across the same exact thing, you know, tomorrow and it's 50. You don't even know the thought process and like how you can separate the thing, how to test it out, like how to really feel comfortable. Like you really weren't taught anything. So um, 
that's one of those things when I do haul videos or when I do videos like this where it highlights seven items or 10 items. Like, I think it's really important to really convey the information to where you guys have a positive experience on your end and you can make some money from this channel. Like, that's really what it is, is that you guys can sit there and go, you know what, I want, maybe I want, you wonder what's behind the scenes of the green room. And that's a really important thing to, to do as well. And so there has to be a lot of good, accurate information given forward on my channel, Raken's channel, um, to in order to build that accurate type of relationship i i realize it's one of those things like i can't just sit there and just tell you like hey check this out like and just tell you all these amazing sales and everything it's really i gotta teach you guys like it's really important so um yeah there's a question there's, there's a remark here by win by doing it says it would be nice if the down votes were followed by constructive criticism so um unfortunately a lot of times it's really easy to downvote something in youtube land unfortunately but um in some of my videos in the past in the past like two weeks so people have said it'd be nice if you could just get this information done in like five minutes and that, that's great but like i think at that point all you're looking for is for a bolo you still don't understand the process behind the whole thing and a process is what, is what makes the hustler the hustler right when someone you know when i hustle with a goes a hustler i realize it's not just like they're, they're just burning and churning and buying things they're like thinking things in their head important decisions are going through their head and uh those if you take a time to if you take the time and invest some time in your life to understand what's really going on um you would be surprised how much you actually do learn right because bolo list will only get you so far um what gets you far is knowledge knowledge so anyway um <laughs> Yeah, that's just one of those things. Uh, you know, it's really easy to it's easy to upload a video, and it's very easy to downvote a video and go, ah, I don't like this guy, and off you go, and that's fine. But uh, you know, you can't please everyone. So if you guys are ever out there trying to build a YouTube channel or considering it, go forward with it. But just know there are some, definitely some people out there that do not like uh, good free information. They just won't like it. So, which is weird. <laughs> I know. Um, I, exactly. Here's, here's a perfect. So someone in here in the feed saying you're teaching us to fish. That's right. I'm not just sitting, you telling, giving you the rod and going right there, put the, you know, put the hook right there. No, I'm like telling you how to string the rod. Why the rod? Why are we fishing at this certain place versus that place? Like, that's the reason why I'm doing these videos. Okay. So let's go into this last, I think last item and, uh, enough of the bona fide rant and here we go. Okay. So this last, uh, I think this is the last item. If I'm not mistaken, let's see, is it? If we're lucky, it's not. Oh, we're, we're lucky. Okay. So, um, all right, let me go into my sheet real quick. Let me check. This one was also found at Goodwill. This was a Toomey. Oh, man. Okay, so six different results for Toomey on that one list. Okay, got it. Okay, so this one was purchased for 1081. Hold on. 1081. Yeah, this one was purchased for $10.81. It's a Toomey garment bag okay and um it's a, you would think it's oh is this kind of like the one that like folds over not really um it's actually like a real bag like intact bag that protects every piece of the luggage that's inside but it's big so it's not like a carry-on kind of thing all right so it's made by Tumi, great brand and uh one of the things that you want to check out with Tumi, i think is really important because i pass on certain Tumis. i don't buy all the Tumis. okay i just don't but I definitely buy the ones that don't have all this weird fraying and stuff on the sides. So as you can see right here, like you follow the edges, especially when you get down here where most of the rub is going to occur. Um, you want to look around all, all these little edges for, you know, fraying of fabric. And it doesn't mean like it's a junk product. It just means that it's going to be, unless you have a really fine set of like, how do I say it? Like fabric scissors, like really tiny, you know, and you want to do some edge clipping, and get all these little fine little hairs out of there or a little fabric hairs that's fine but when it gets when it gets too crazy i just pass on the item because it's just too much and it's definitely indicative of like a fair amount of wear but we can see on this item when we fall around the edges like there's none of that so and plus the only real stains or something like that because that's kind of like the bummer about to me is like sometimes they produce these lighter colors but then the lighter colors especially when they deal with airplane luggage you know what happens, right? It gets dirty, right? Maybe it falls on the tarmac. It definitely rubs up against other people's luggage and it goes on the conveyor belt and it goes here, there. It's on baggage claim. It gets thrown into an SUV, you know, and it starts getting dirty. So, you know, that's one of those things. Did I clean this thing? No, I didn't clean this thing, right? But I disclosed that it has certain smudge marks like right here, right there. Definitely you can see some right here. 
But surprisingly enough, the edges where there should be a lot of discoloration doesn't really have much at all. So that's great. So you want to check the handle that it's intact. Everything is good. If you can locate the shoulder strap, that's great because that goes right here and it goes to the other side as well. I uh, can't remember if this bag had it or not. I think it had it inside one of the compartments. But uh, <clears throat> so and I think this is also a place for like a cell phone holder or something like that. Kind of a bummer about this bag is that without that shoulder strap, you know, try to transport this thing around kind of sucks. It does not have real, uh, wheels or anything like that. It's just a garment bag that's not hard case either. It's soft in the middle. And the only part that's really tough and hard is this outside section right here, which helps it retain its shape or its upright nature. Um, so there's the Tumi tag inside. Just because something has a Tumi tag also, um, I've come to find out that doesn't exactly mean that it's real. So be careful when you have a Tumi tag. If you have any speculation that the Tumi thing might not be authentic, um, you can, so far what I've heard, and uh, it came from a bad review of mine on eBay or a potentially bad review, but someone's like, hey, I brought this to a Tumi place. And this is not this bag, but another bag. And he was like, they said it wasn't authentic. So I guess they can do that. I know that Louis Vuitton won't authenticate things, for example, if you come in with a purse. But Tumi might. So you, if you have one of those stores in your mall or something like that, you might want to think about it. But anyway, um, this one looked crazy authentic. I've only had one out of many to me bags go sour. So I'm not going to let it really, you know, deter me from reselling to me, but it's definitely something to keep in mind just because you see the metal tag doesn't hundred percent mean that it is actually uh, real. So here's the inside of it. Of course, the inside is going to look a lot better than the outside because, you know, inside doesn't hit the tarmac, doesn't rub against people's luggage and all that stuff. It's more protected. You have things for belts and ties on the side right here. Very nice. And then you have the thing where you can hang it inside a room. Like as soon as you get into a room, you can hang it up on a, on a, uh, you know, clothing rack kind of thing and then unfold it. And it's really nice looking. So anyway, that was a pretty good one. 135 bucks. It sold for uh, $10 and 81 cents. I purchased it for, I thought it was a really good flip. Definitely want to show you guys that one. Cause a lot of times when people hustle to me, they're thinking these black bags and stuff like that. Well, you know, don't sit there. And uh, if you find these things in the wild and they're upright like this, a lot of thrift stores with a lot of inventory, they're going to put their upright bags kind of just upright like that. And if you didn't take the time to pull this thing out and see the tag that said to me, you'd probably miss it, right? Because this looks almost like the side of every freaking bag out there. And so, you know, maybe take the time and check out brands. Now, another brand that you want to check out that's pretty cool, that's very kind of under the radar is Tom Bin, T-O-M-B-I-H-N. Yeah, you definitely want to check that one out because... Every now and then you'll find that one in the wild, whether it be a garage sale or a thrift store. But just trust me, look up Tom, B-I-H-N. Okay. Um, let's go into the last <laughs> last flip here. I believe this is the last one. Um, let me look this one up. This one came from a garage sale. And this is a Cooper leather goatskin jacket. All right, this was a $20 find that sold for 110 so this one was a garage sale. It was one of the early ones in the morning. I remember this. This was before 8 a.m. in the morning. So this was definitely pre-golden hour. Um, saw it hanging up. I think it was like on a clothesline that was like from a tree to a tree kind of clothesline. And I went right up to it immediately because when I see jackets like this, like I think bomber, I think, you know, things like that. But this is not really a true bomber jacket. It's just a leather goatskin jacket that's almost bomber style, but really not bomber. Because true bomber jacket has like sheepskin inside and it's the leather is not goatskin. It's just hard, tough, um, and it's definitely an insulated type jacket because you got to remember, they're up in bombers, right? Way up in the sky. It's cold as hell, and those bombers don't have the greatest heating elements either. So, um, yeah, a true jacket from, like, the war time era is going to run a pretty good pen pretty penny on eBay. But these are more like everyday wear type of jackets that are still sold today. The company is called Cooper. And you can see the actual brand right there. Little Velcro place where you can put a patch. That's pretty neat. This one even had a small micro blemish, which you can kind of see right there by the zipper line. Nothing crazy. So, you know, still sold for great money. And, uh, you know, $109.99. And it was only a $20 find. I thought it was great. And you can tell just by the interior tags, it really has not been worn that much. because There's no discoloration going on here. 
it looks pretty good. And the overall quality of the jacket was pretty stellar with the exception of that one tiny thing right there. So definitely something to look out for anytime you're at a garage sale or, you know, a majority of the jackets that you probably will, you'll probably be passing up. But when you see these brown type jackets like this and some look smooth, um, and then the, if you ever see ones that look like crazy tough and tarnished, you should automatically start thinking bomber jacket, maybe a cafe racer type jacket, um, motorcycle jacket, because that's where good money is, right? Bomber jackets, uh, cafe racer jackets, motorcycle jackets, and then some of this everyday wear type stuff that is a little bit military inspired yet more everyday kind of product, right? So very interesting type of flip. I was one of the very first things that popped on in the morning. E-Money was with me. He didn't quite understand it, but I was like, hey, just trust me. So there it is. Um, that's pretty much uh, the show. When you're doing one of those jackets, by the way, really be meticulous and check out you know, look everywhere for every possible place. There could be a stitch kind of issue or um, places where there could be, you know, crazy amounts of wear and tear. Cause I truly did not find that little blemish or stain until I got home. So, you know, that was on me. Now, if I had found that in the field, 20 bucks, like I might've been like able to point it out and maybe got the jack for 10 bucks, but uh, I still paid 20 bucks, which was actually full price. And the garage had just opened up. There's sometimes, <laughs> when a garage sale opens up and it's such a great item, I don't try to like talk them down. So anyway, I have a weird cough. Sorry. Okay. So that's pretty much uh, it. I hope you enjoyed the show and um, hope you get, hopefully you guys learned something. So like I said, I don't really ask that much, but I'll ask it on this show. Take a second and hit the like button, which is down there. And if you want to be notified, I get this question all the time. How can I get notified of your live shows, Bonafide Hustler? It's pretty easy. You look at the subscribe button down on my channel, and to the right of it, there should be a little bell. You hit that bell, and then every time I go live, it'll basically notify you. So that's really important. Um, tomorrow, which is Wednesday on the Green Room Hangout, we have an impressive impressive guest, I think, someone that opened up a brick and mortar store with books. So that should be a lot of fun as well. And a uh, couple more things to recap. If you want the free guide for 100 amazing items to resell, check that out down below. It's the first link. And the last thing I want to tell you guys, if you want to check out the green room, um, there's that's the second link down below. All right, greenroomuniversity.com. That is pretty much the show. I'm going to be back again, hopefully tomorrow or the next day with some really cool content. Um, I want to make a video about these BB guns that I found and pellet guns that I've found at garage sales over the past two years because I've actually kept them and I like them. And I think I have like six now or something like that. And they're fun. Like I really, really like playing with them and everything. So I haven't sold them, but it's pretty cool because you guys can learn the differences between differences, differences between the guns. I can't really speak today. Um, you know how they load. Why does one take a pellet of this caliber versus another? What the hell is a BB in the first place? What does feet per second mean? All that kind of stuff. I think it's really important. So I think I want to do that, that kind of a video. It's going to take a little bit more editing, but it should be a lot of fun. So I'll see you guys on the next Bonafide Hustler video. Thanks for the support. And uh, put a comment down below. You know, if you watch this after it's live, still, you know, put a comment down below. I still read comments. I just can't get to them all. So take it easy, guys. Good to see you. Bye-bye.